Welcome to the second panel discussion of the Groundwater Summit, hopefully slightly less controversial, but we don't know what's in store for us. <laughs> the objective of this panel is going to be to have a discussion about groundwater availability, how it is that we determine groundwater availability on a technical level, and then follow that with a reflection about how availability is determined both by hydrogeological and economic constraints. So, before we introduce the panel, well, let's introduce the panel. Van Kelly, Daryl Peckham, Justin C. Thompson, welcome. Thank you so much for participating in this. I'm gonna ask each of you, you've got a microphone right next to you, and I'm gonna ask each of you if you wouldn't just mind giving us a few minute introduction to who you are and, and, and your background. Okay, um, my name is Van Kelly, I'm with Intera, and I'm a hydrogeologist, senior hydrogeologist, been studying it for a long time. Um, came out of a and and my passion actually is kind of the science of groundwater availability. I'm not much of a policy guy, but I love the science piece. Thank you. And, and you actually have your own microphone, Daryl. Oh, I do. Uh, you oh, do? Thanks. Sorry. That's all right. But we share, right? That's what we do in the groundwater? <laughs> Hello? No. Maybe. Hello? Yes, sir. Ah, very good. My name is Daryl Peckham. I'm a hydrogeologist. And uh, just to give you a, a little bit of the background, in 1980, I kept my shotgun in the office of Wayne Wyatt. So I've been around groundwater management for a little while. And, uh, and, and really, it's just been, you know, groundwater has been a passion. Started with the state of Texas, 15 years there, 13 years of private consulting, three years with a nonprofit. Um, every, every city should have a John Bushman and should have a nonprofit to just give groundwater guidance. And, and in the last three years I've been uh, with my wife a little mom and pop consulting and just enjoying everything there is to enjoy about it. Wonderful. Thank you, Daryl. And Justin, we are going to turn it over to you and then ask you to give your presentation. So good afternoon. My name is Justin Thompson. I am a PhD student at the Jackson School of Geoscience at UT. And I recently completed uh, a master's degree in energy and earth resources and global policy studies, also from UT. Thank you. So we're delighted to have a combination of, of, of technical hydrogeologists and then also have this academic um, consideration. So what we're going to do is in order to kind of get us primed for this conversation, is we've asked Justin if he wouldn't give us kind of a high-level overview of his study and findings as a, a point of inspiration to then discuss groundwater availability. So I'll invite you up here. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, as we said, I'm going to present uh, my thesis research, and I get uh, 13 minutes to introduce groundwater availability. So I'm going to set a timer here, and hopefully we'll stay on target. So let me just jump right in. Uh, most of us are familiar with the 2017 state water plan and the projected deficits of water availability therein. If you do a little bit of math, the plan doesn't necessarily do it for you, you can find that 95% of the deficits projected by the state water plan are due to declines in groundwater availability. So that begs the question, what is groundwater availability? What does that mean? <laughs> um, interestingly, you'll get different answers depending on who you ask. Uh, in the 2017 state water plan, it talks about groundwater availability as the amount of water that could be withdrawn under drought of record conditions. Is that the same thing as the amount of water that could be withdrawn legally under current management regimes? Good question. For me, I was really interested in the question of what is legally permissible versus what is feasible to extract, right? So my, my presentation is about the latter. What is the feasibility of extraction? Uh, we're all sort of familiar, I think, with groundwater management uh, under DFCs which are frequently expressed as a drawdown over time. When I say drawdown, I mean 
you know, a dewatering or a reduction in the, high, the potentiometric surface over time. <clears throat> the question has been asked, are we experiencing a regulation-induced shortage of groundwater under DFC management? Support for this argument is offered by the statutory term total estimated recoverable storage. I'm going to call it TERS from here on out. TERS is simply 25% and 75% of total storage of an aquifer. Um, for example, the Carrizo Wilcox reports total storage in the billions, over 5 billion acre feet of water. Now, importantly, terms like TERS take no account of key management considerations like subsidence, water quality, and surface water interaction. And I think this is what's really interesting. In the latest TERS report, when I was writing my thesis report, not even the economic viability of removing the water, <laughs> right? Almost perhaps its namesake purpose, right? So I got really interested in this question of, well, what would be the feasible extraction limits of groundwater? And to answer this question, I came up with a term that I call maximum economically recoverable storage, or MERS for short. I think you have to point straight back. So <clears throat> this is a single cell reservoir simulation. It's, a, it's very simple, right? Um, and, it, and particularly, I simulated agricultural users pumping a single well, right? Well, why agricultural users? Well, interestingly, they use a lot of water. And importantly, you can relate the amount of water that they use to the value they get from that water to the surface area, which may be a, a property ownership, which may be really interesting to folks looking at unitization or some other forms of groundwater ownership. Um, what I did was I simulated water levels falling over time. So for example, under a 50-year DFC that says 65 feet of drawdown. Um, what my model does is it determines the maximum feasible volume under economic and hydrogeological considerations, just those two pieces. And those two pieces are yet simplified. Um, Importantly, my model uses key user inputs, right? So what I do not have for you is a magic bullet to all groundwater management issues, right? What your local conditions are, and I mean local for one user, one pumping well, are going to greatly affect the results of my model. And we're going to see this. So how did I do this? Well, let's see. I looked at the study area of the Carrizo Wilcox. Why? As I said, it has quite a lot of water in storage. But also, importantly, it, it's down dip, right? So much of this storage water occurs at depth, right? I've got a cross section here, and then also a capture from the Texas Water Development Board 3D uh, viewing program, which I think is lovely. If you haven't seen it yet, go take a look. And this really illustrates that much of the water here is at great depth. Compare this to perhaps the Ogallala, right? Which I think historically is much more productive than the Carrizo Wilcox. There, much of the water is at, at more shallow depth and water table conditions, no less. So how did I do this in detail? This is the slide for all the nerds in the audience. <laughs> what I'm talking about is a linear convex optimization, specifically a maximization, right? So I have a function that I've, I've created limits to. Right? Well, what are those limits? Well, the first limit is an economic limit, right? Where you look at the marginal value of the water you're pumping. How, how many dollars per year do you get from that acre foot or those 100 acre foot that you pumped, right? Versus the cost of pumping that water. Now, Importantly, my model constrains your pumping to the point where your marginal value equals your marginal cost. What does that mean? That means you are not making any money anymore. <laughs> so importantly, this is not a desirable or economically efficient outcome, but it is a justifiable limit to what you might call feasibly extractable. To look specifically at how I determine pumping costs and, and uh, groundwater extraction costs, I really focus specifically on changing pumping costs with depth to water over time. Importantly, um, the way I did this was I translated the depth to water. This is you know, your potentiometric surface, confined, unconfined, doesn't really matter, uh, and converted that to horsepower requirements for pumping. Right? And if you know what your power cost is, you know, say six, seven, eight cents per kilowatt hour, for example, you can kind of come up with a dollar per acre foot value or cost of what you've pumped. Second constraint is the demand over the hydrogeologic capacity. And this is another important reason for using agriculture as a user, right? Because what I can do is I can assume that plants are thirsty at a constant rate, right? You can't really defer pumping from one month to another during the growing season. So what this shows is that 
each aquifer is only capable of producing a certain pumping rate, depending on what your transmissivity is, your water levels, et cetera. At some point, as transmissivity falls, you're going to hit a limit where you can no longer pump what you need in a day to water your crops. Together with the third limit of a well screen, this kind of provides a bottom to the aquifer. This gives you the very maximum of what you could produce. If you have a minimum pumping rate to water your crops, then you're going to create a certain amount of drawdown. I assume that you don't want to create drawdown below the, the point where you're uh, the top of your wellhead, because if you did, you'd cavitate your pump, right? So these two things together, two and three, create a bottom of the aquifer. So if that's clear as mud to you, let's look at some pictures. <laughs> sort it out. First, let's look at pumping rate versus demand. Um, first, let me say, don't worry too much about the pumping rate here on the far end of the axis. This is purely mathematically possible, and has this line, blue line here, showing your maximum pumping rate over time, does not include well characteristics yet. So what this is showing is as you de your depth to water increases due to dewatering over time, your maximum pumping rate falls. Now here we see, here's this purple line, which I think the colors may be hard to see, so forgive me. This is your wellhead limit, right? And I did not assume that you would pump you know, as much as you could pump. I assumed you'd pump in an amount equal to your demand, right? So if you have, you're trying to irrigate half an inch over an acre in a day, that's the pumping rate I looked at. So here you've got a well screen limit, and this red line shows you uh, the limit that you would have to have to be able to pump that much in one day. So what this shows is, once you, at this pumping rate, if you got past about 560 feet in depth, this aquifer simulated here would not be capable of supporting your pumping needs. On the right, you can see how this varies a little bit with demand. So again, I, I mostly modeled a half an inch irrigation demand per acre per day, but you can see how if your irrigation demand is somewhat less, then your maximum pumping rate is a bit smaller and therefore you could go a bit further before your, the aquifer can't support you. Oh, yeah, well, that's fine. Well, I guess I skipped a slide on accident. I just want to show this changes, watch this, right? It changes depending on your hydraulic conductivity, right? Which is obviously spatially variable depending on where you are. If, if your aquifer is, uh, has better hydraulic conductivity, the better the product, productivity. So then let's look briefly at profits versus depth. Now watch how the axes have changed here. Right now, this is profits on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is the same thing, increasing depth to water over time. What this says is, this blue line says I have a certain value that I'm getting from the water I'm pumping, and as my pumping costs increase with depth, my profits decrease, right? So here for reference, this is the top of the aquifer. I've, I simulated 2,000 feet as the bottom of the aquifer in the confined setting. And way over here, that purple line, that's the wellhead limit. Importantly, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, these results are highly subjective, right? Again, what is the value of the water you're pumping? This kind of shows the difference uh, between users, right? So here I have a blue line showing uh, about $883 per uh, acre per year to get you to 2,000 feet at zero profits. But look here, this at 700 feet, what I modeled as the unconfined bottom of the aquifer, is way back here. What this would mean is that in order to get to the, all the storage below 700 feet, this user cannot produce economically. This user can, and here I have some reference values for agriculture. They're probably not quite right, but they should be in the ballpark. You can see, you know, alfalfa, cannot reach most of the stored water here, but uh, you know, uh, grains at a much higher profit can. So here, this is just kind of what we've already seen with the profit function, but here we're showing all the limits in one page. This red line is the 24-hour pumping limit for agricultural user. This purple line is the wellhead limit. And this black line, for reference, is the most exhaustive desired future condition in my study area of 65 feet drawdown over 50 years. So what this shows, uh, theoretically, is that if, and this is a big if, you are willing to accept declining profits over time as your pumping costs increase, theoretically, all of this volume here is producible, is feasible to produce. Similarly, the right graph shows the same thing with a higher hydraulic conductivity. You see that the red line has shifted and the minimum pumping uh, demand 24-hour satisfaction has shifted to the right. 
uh, just one more time to kind of make the same point, right? Um, here again, I've got $883 per acre per year, but here only 309, which would get you to the bottom of the aquifer in the unconfined setting. Just showing that this model, again, is designed for user inputs, right? The, the outputs are very much tailored to your um, local conditions, if I can use that term. So running out of time, complex subject, a lot to talk about. Let's kind of wrap it up and uh, summarize, if I can. So, you know, looking at it in a, in a very critical sense, um, in the hydrogeology, available groundwater is limited by, okay, it's bounded by um, the transmissivity, right, in, in one part. As your water levels fall, and this is for confined or unconfined, okay, it doesn't really matter if you're dewatering the aquifer or not, your water levels and your depth to water still increases over time. Therefore, your pumping costs increase over time. Right? And importantly, you get to a point in the hydrogeology where the aquifer will no longer sustain the pumping rate that you need. Uh, again, economics, the costs rise, profits fall with rising water depth, uh, depth to water, I should say. And I, again, I really want to emphasize this point. I apply a limit saying you are losing money if you pump past this point. That's not economically efficient or desirable, but it is one limit, we could say, to what's feasible to produce. Again, I can't stress this enough. Uh, everybody, or a lot of the folks in this room, I think are infinitely familiar with the challenges of working in the intersection of science and policy. Uh, my hat is off to you. I do not look at the very complex considerations of subsidence, water quality, or surface water. Any one or all of those may be reasons not to pursue uh, a desired future condition that would be closer to what would be maximum extractable. And importantly, um, you know, so, so there's a trade-off. Do you want to produce now, re remove from storage, right, and create dewatering, and at the same time accept those pumping costs, or put that off, right? And that's a really complex question that environmental resource economics can help us answer, but I do not answer here in the context of, of this study in great detail. Um, TERS, for the record, you know, it's really extremely difficult to kind of compare TERS volumes to uh, my MERS volumes because, again, the user inputs are so specific. But interestingly, we can think about the fact that we can quantify the cost of pumping from greater depth. So we can probably generalize to say that terms like TERS that estimate based purely on the total volume may overestimate the amount of water that's available at great depth where pumping costs may be restrictive, or may underestimate it in aquifers of shallow depth. Again, the, I have 13 minutes to talk about a thesis project that was three years in the making and is over 100 pages long. If you're you know, interested or you just need uh, some sleep time reading material, I invite you to please check out the full length version online. Uh, thank you very much. That's my 13 or so minutes. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Justin. Um, I've been fascinated to have this conversation. And I think it, it's, it's very timely because I think there's a broader discussion that's happening statewide about groundwater availability from a policy side. And so I think we're gonna jump straight into a big picture question for the panelists to answer, uh, generally speaking, which is why do we care about determining groundwater availability? Um, you know. Is it purely a technical discussion? Are there other components to it? What, what, why do we care about it? What's important about it? Go ahead, Van. Yes, by all means. I'll start. Daryl can embellish. Um, you know, groundwater availability, you need it for planning. So that's why the Water Development Board started the whole program. It used to happen in the regional water planning group, so that word planning in it. But you need to have, a number, you need to have an estimate of regionally, what can we pull from this aquifer and rely on um, for our needs over some time frame? And, um, you know, it's no different than the surface water availability concepts. It's no different than wanting to understand what's the ultimate firm yield of that reservoir. You, you need a planning number by which you can move from. And, and hopefully that somehow ties to management. Mm -hmm. um, it should. But that, that's how I see and, and, and it's uh, both technical and it's, uh, you know, I think it's 
I think all of these subject matter in my mind are technical, but technical from an aquifer uh, physics perspective, certainly, but also it's technical from societal and economic issues like Justin was talking about there. Sure. Thank That's you. how I see it. Thank you. Daryl? Well, and I, and I agree completely with Van and, and, and building on that, the, the other group that benefits from it is development. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, because it comes down to, for development, determining an investment decision. And so estimating your availability for your project is critical. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and so it goes hand in hand with planning. And, uh, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, and, and I think that what Justin's working with adds that extra dimension of the economic feasibility. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think planning and development will both benefit from this understanding. Sure. Thank you. So, I mean, I, I wanted to make sure that we started off with the recognition that availability is important for a number of, of reasons, right? But for the sake of this conversation, what I've asked our panelists to do is to really focus on the technical component of it, to really focus on what is technically available, and then, and then the, the physical or economic constraints to that, right? And so we're really going to be pulling from your expertise from a technical perspective there. So the first thing I wanted to do is ask you, Van, on a technical level to explain to us what we're talking about when we consider availability, what are the factors that you have to consider, and how is availability affected by pumping, frequency, time of year, that whole thing? Okay, that's a big one. Um, all right, I'll try to do that. Um, and I'm going to stay, by you saying technical, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay over in aquifer physics. Is that where you want to stay? Precisely. Okay, good. So groundwater, when I think of groundwater availability, in fact, it's not when I think about it. The, the, the whole uh, water, groundwater hydrology uh, uh, literature, which started talking about this back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and forward, always talked about it as a yield. Availability was typically a yield, and they used to use the term basin yield quite a bit, or we say aquifer yield, basin yield, and we've also heard the term safe yield. So, uh, so what you want to understand, um, what factors are important when you're looking at an aquifer, let's talk from a regional perspective now, and Daryl hit some things on a more local level, likely. Um, what's important are, is how much that aquifer is discharging, which under pre-development conditions equals the amount that it's recharging, and, it's how mu and what are the storage characteristics of that aquifer. Okay, th that, those are the two prime things that I would be looking at, and there's a reason for that. So if we were looking at a, to say we want to produce that aquifer on a sustainable basis, and when I say sustainable, I want to say that we want to be able to produce it forever, or f our foreseeable future forever. Well, in that case, uh, you have to understand, well, wh what happens when we pump, a, pump an aquifer? If we pump an aquifer, the water comes from two places, and sometimes three. It comes from uh, pulling water out of storage, that's initial, and that's why we see the water level drop. But if that water level stops dropping and we can produce that amount of water every week, every year, every month, then it's finally also captured some aquifer discharge somewhere, okay? Be it cross flow, be it stream base flow, be it evapotranspiration. It's grabbed some water somewhere. It's just a continuity equation, it's physics. And so these are the two things that are critical to that, to that puzzle. And it's, it's similar to, uh, similar to but not the same as a, a stock tank. If you had water, if you had a full stock tank, you have water coming in one side, let's call that a recharge. You have water going out the other side, it's coming over the dam. Those two ins and outs are exactly equal in pre-development. Then you start pumping your pond. If you pump more than it's going over the dam, you ultimately will have an empty pond. And so that's the principle of the sustainable versus unsustainable. And so I'm gonna finish up last on pumping and location. That analogy is great, it's seductive, um, it's way over simplistic and aquifers don't work that way. So uh, it's really important where you're pumping as to what's sustainable. Um, 
pumping location is critical to it. So Thank with you. that, I'll hand it over to Daryl. Thank you. Well, so Daryl, you, you uh, mentioned earlier the importance to development, which is exactly what I, I was really interested in having you contribute to this panel was from your experience and working in different parts of Texas on some larger development projects, you know, does the way that you determine groundwater availability de vary depending on which aquifer you're in? Um, if so, what are the different factors that you're taking into consideration when you think about the economic viability? What's, what's been your experience with that? Well, it, uh, it really doesn't matter which aquifer. And, and generally, the approach is the same. And, um, but what but really, really matters is your, is your site. Because the availability, the availability for a project, and really availability, is the ability of the aquifer to yield water to your wells. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, just boil it down and make it as simple as possible. And so when you're looking to do a project, it's all about the site. What are the conditions at the site? You know, I mean, you, know, you have an aquifer on the map and it's all one color. Well, it can be very, very different from site to site. And so when you're developing for uh, a, a site for an individual well or well field, you, you really have to collect all of the available information you have to construct your conceptual site model. You, you have to have a, a parameter of how to approach this thing. Obviously, what is it that this project is hoping to be able to achieve in terms of the amount of water that it can produce and for how long? And, and when, it, when you get into that, when you get into that part of it, you really have to get into testing and proving. What can it do? What are the factors that you're really looking for? You're looking for the boundaries. You're looking for the things that will cause you to have your water levels drop as you pump at a more rapid rate so that you don't meet your, your volume that you need for the project over time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's really, how does it flow within that site? What constrains your ability to get water into the well? Thank you. So I think in our, in our prep conversation, you, you said um, really wonderfully that water availability as, as a general number is really, a, it's a planning tool, right? That, that's, that's what we use it for. And, and, and I think that there was some consensus among the panelists that in terms of true availability, it's very site specific. And, and I think that that kind of responds and reflects back to some of the local management um, you know, constructs that we have in Texas. <laughs> Certainly. So to the full panel, you know, we've just heard this presentation. From, from Justin on his research on the physical and financial feasibility of uh, producing groundwater, and in doing so, determining groundwater availability. Um, what are your thoughts on how we assess the financial feasibility component right now? Do you have any thoughts just from your experience technically? And, and Justin, if you've had any thoughts since, since their responses, you're welcome to chime in as well. It's kind of a broad question. <laughs> Let me take a shot. Let me go first. Go first. <laughs> well, uh, Justin, very good work. Thank you. Very good work. And, and adding the economic component to your physical feasibility of availability is, 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 is really, really beneficial to getting a feel for, for how it all really works in the real world of, yeah, you can have all the, world, all the water in the world available, but if it's not economically feasible, the, the, it, just, it just doesn't matter. Um, and and what, I, what I really jumped out at me from Justin's work is that he, he's actually building a set of tools that allows evaluation of the economic impact of management, which is, I think, is very useful to the groundwater conservation districts. You know, what is, what is the impact of this decision? Well, I think it's very interesting from, a, from a, an applicant, from a producer standpoint, right, to, to consider that. And so maybe on that, on a very practical level, as a hydrogeologist, 
what are you, what are some, you know, you've already talked about the, the, the model site specific, but are there any other factors that you advise to your clients specifically to be thinking through on the financial side of things? I mean, is, is that, is it just gallons per minute? Uh, on, on the big projects? Yes, sir. I, I don't touch that liability. <laughs> <laughs> they, they got, you know, they got big money and they got people that know how money works. Okay. Well, so then, Van, let's, let's go back to that idea of the, you know, maximum sustainable groundwater pumping discussion that we slightly touched on and that slightly came, that came up last session as, as a concept as well. Okay. Um, what would that have meant, and what does it mean relative to total estimated recoverable storage as a, as a bookend on the other end? Just help us understand kind of what that spectrum looks like. Okay. Can I jump? into Absolutely. that conversation By all means. for just a second. I, I totally agree, and hats off to Justin. It's excellent. I'm really glad that someone's starting to crack this nut open again. And um, so, great job. Uh, I believe, uh, you know, a lot of us here deal in the joint planning process, and so I just kind of want to go back and revisit that. Because obviously that, it gets a little hard to think about Justin's model and how we go, go approach joint planning, but, I mean, it's... It's very informative for joint planning. And so I go back to the last round and what we, we attempted to do in, in GMA 8, and, and you know, it would be up to the people in GMA 8 as to whether we succeeded in any way, is that we tried to say, okay, what are instead of just think about drawdowns and so forth, we looked at what are the impacts to the wells that are in districts or in counties or in aquifers. And in a way, that's economic, right? right? Because available drawdown is quite critical to producing groundwater. And so I think there is a way, you know, to kind of hybrid, use simplified models on the economic side of how, how far do we want our levels to drop in this region that's economic and bring it back in and try to think of it in a planning perspective. And then you can use much more simple uh, proxies than, the, than a sophisticated uh, MATLAB model of saying, well, where does that water level sit relative to the uh, location of the screen, say, or on top of the aquifer or whatever. Mm. Anyway, long, I just wanted to go back and read that because I think it is applicable. I think you can do it. Okay, I've got to get my cheat sheet because uh, I can never remember these words. And since it didn't become an acronym, there's just no way. <laughs> um, it didn't make it. it. Didn't make it that far. What would it have been the acronym? Uh, it would MSGP? have been MSGP. That okay, like that, that's probably your, good that it yeah. didn't make it up. Yeah, it sounds like something you put in your food. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does. <laughs> well, it isn't. So, um, so it, the, the terminology again. I got to read it. Uh, so it was a last last session. We had a consensus bill come out of the TWCA Groundwater Committee. Basically. Uh, trying to change the water code to have this term called uh, modeled sustainable groundwater pumping. And so what did that mean? So the concept was, is how much could we pump from an aquifer um, and into perpetuity? So effectively forever. So, it's, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, that equates to recharge. And I said location of pumping is important. Doesn't necessarily equate to, to recharge. There are other factors that are uh, at play there. And um, so the, the thought process um, of why, I think why the, the committee wanted or the panel wanted that to, to come out had, was somewhat related to TERS, I think. But I, I believe, you know, in the water code, we're, we need to look at producing water. We have to look at, when we, when we go through the nine factors of setting a DFC, we have to look at highest practicable all the way over to conservation and preservation. Right? Socioeconomic impact. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So the thought process was, well, if we know what this amount of water that could come out of the aquifer essentially ad infinitum with all its foibles, because it's certainly not perfect, okay? It's not an accurate estimate. It is an estimate. And um, then we thought, well, that would be kind of a bookend to TERS uh, to be considered. It's not a regulatory. It wasn't considered to be a regulatory anything, it was really meant to be information that could inform uh, the joint planning process. That's why we did it. And, and the last thing I'll say on it is, um, you know, I, I think it was somewhat response to TERS. Uh, that makes sense to me, but I would like to make one key, key distinction there. 
uh, that I feel pretty strongly about. Um, when we talk about availability, we're talking about basin yields or, or, or aquifer yields. A yield is trying to understand what will this aquifer give me based upon the physics of the aquifer itself and the other societal constraints we put on it, either legal, economic, environmental, whatever we put on it. TERS is not that. TERS does not have anything to do with the groundwater flow equation in it. It is not an estimate of availability and it's not a yield. So it's the odd man out in our process. So. I saw a lot of heads nodding. Um, anything y'all want to chime in on that? Justin? I mean, I would just, you know, sort of respond to that and, and agree completely. TERS, nor the model I built, MERS, is a yield, right? They're, they're frequently confused because they're both volumes, right? But to me, when we think about a yield and the yield continuum all the way from, you know, sustainable use to, you know, maximum extractive mining, that is a, a policy decision that involves a lot of decision criteria, many of which, for example, I did not consider, right? So I would agree completely um, with, with that, that TERS nor MERS is intent, should be or is intended in my part as a yield. Thank you. Daryl, did you want, did you want to I agree in? completely. I love it. I love it when my panels agree. This is great. Um, so let's, I'd like to ask uh, two final questions to you and then, and then I'm going to open it up to you all if you have any questions. Again, uh, feel free to tweet those questions at hashtag TXGroundwater2018. I feel like I'm giving you an ad. I'm not. Um, look at that. So the last two questions that I have are, are there other ways for us to consider groundwater availability? And, and we've already listed all of the, the policy considerations that have to be a part of it, right? Because again, we're managing things with human constructs. We've taken very nicely from the last panel. But are there other, other mechanisms, other factors that we should be considering in determining availability? Who's we? It's <laughs> a great question. We'll start with that. <laughs> Maybe the groundwater districts. Because we're active players, right, in determining availability that's, that's there then for permitting or for planning purposes, and it scales up from a ground decision all the way up to uh, the state water plan as well, doesn't it? I see the excitement on your face, Daryl. <laughs> that's because you know that I think, I think it's a trap, but for groundwater districts to, uh, to have to worry about trying to estimate availability I mean, we just saw, we just saw all of the factors that go into it. And, and their focus is on managing the aquifer. And estimating the results of their management, that, that's really for planning. That, it, and it's really for planning and development. But it, it, I, I think it, it diverts their resources from what they're actually tasked to do and manage the aquifer. And that's, you know, I mean, you, Sure. You, you know. But we have to have a budget, right, from which we make these decisions. So mm -hmm. therein lies uh, a struggle. Any other thoughts or, or questions on that? I think um, it'd be nice if they were separable easily. I think planning and management are reasonably connected. Because if you go into that room, whoever you are, I don't care, this is not, GCD specific or whoever, and they say, someone tells you, come up with how y'all want to look this aquifer to look in the long run, it should be consistent with management. So there has to be some connection. How that exactly works, I'm not a policy guy, I'm going to go to science. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I think, you know, it's interesting. This, this is a hard problem, and there's a journal article that came out in 2015 at Water Resources Research. And it basically said the biggest challenge in groundwater and, it, you know, management is this very issue. It's, it's wedding the issues of environment, economics, and models that can actually get, do a decent job of reasonably predicting the important things. And so that's where I'm going to trail off to. You know, the state has done a wonderful thing, I think, um, in developing their planning process and actually putting the resources available to develop tools. Um, obviously, we've been involved with that. They're not, they're not perfect. They, they have their issues, but they're very important. And they can be improved, because we have an adaptive process in, in regional planning. We do. 
So I think if we were going to focus on that, you know, there were two things that I said were technically important to me when I think about availability. And one is discharge from that system, and one is storage. And so I believe that there should be uh, enhanced focus on the concepts of the, the um, how that aquifer actually discharges, because it's critically important to the sustainability of the system, understanding how much you can develop and what the impacts would be. And as it turns out, for most aquifers, most discharge is occurring in the outcrop. And that's where we have our interactions with our streams. So this is a, a key factor that I think, if we could put more attention to that, I'm not getting into the legal space, I'm not going to the connection of groundwater and, and or the lack of, therefore, in, in law. Um, I'm just saying from a physical perspective of trying to understand what can my system do, uh, it's critical. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. So a final question to you, Justin, uh, because you are uh, now a doctoral student and, and going to pursue this topic further. Is there anything that, that you're going to continue to be looking at or um, hope to continue to study? Well, yeah, there's, I mean, there's obviously, honestly, a, um, a whole bunch of what I think are really interesting questions that I discovered along the way in doing my master's thesis. Um, and some of them I hope to continue to pursue under uh, the guise of PhD work. Um, so, for example, again, sort of nerd lingo, if you will, but some, you know, comprehensive sensitivity analyses, right, to marginal changes in costs and things like that. And if I can just sort of close that thought by responding to what the rest of the panel was just saying. You know, I, I once heard it said that science without policy is just book writing, and policy without science is just guesswork, right? They're, the two need one another, uh, and it's a difficult line to walk, um, but it's, it's critical. Uh, it really is. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, folks, we're going to wrap it up and turn it over to questions at this time. I've got a couple of uh, Twitter questions that have come through. Um, anybody else want to come up to the microphone to submit any questions? Maybe I'll start with one of the Twitter questions um, as we have somebody come up. The question is, what about impacts to other wells or surface water? Should that be factored into site conditions or determining availability at the site conditions? How, how uh, should, the, should those be factors that are a part of determining groundwater availability at a particular site? Do you have any thoughts on that, Daryl? Well, I, I would just say that, that that's really the question for the management entity. And if, if it's an important part of why they're managing, then, then certainly. Yes, and, and then uh, planning and development has to respond to figuring that into their estimate of availability. Okay, thank you. So that's to your point, the, the, the local management there, to respond to conditions that they've determined they should be managing to or not, which you bring up a lot. Do we have any questions from the floor? Ma'am, if I could ask you to go to the microphone, that'd be great. I'm Carol Patterson. I'm on the Edwards Aquifer Authority Board. And I have a, a follow-up to the, the question of what can my groundwater system do, which is shouldn't we be going to the larger question of the greater conjunctive yield of surface and groundwater management as opposed to just the sum of the firm yield of groundwater sources and the firm yield of surface water. And to give you an example, sort of hypothetical, um, but if you say that the firm yield of the Edwards Aquifer is somewhere around 200,000 acre feet if you're constrained by this spring flow, and your firm yield of Canyon Lake is 100,000 acre feet, but you have floodwaters that are not being managed and could be added to the Edwards. Doesn't that give the state a far longer term amount of water, assuming we could all cooperate someday, but, um, and assuming also that we're not ever going to get to any kind of limit on population? <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, any of our panelists want to, to respond to any of those reflections? I'll take, least, I'll take at least part of it. I mean, just for me, speaking for myself, um, academically, of course, right? Ideally, we would love to see uh, you know, discussions, management, et cetera, on groundwater connected to surface water. I mean, this is a big push in the academic hydro community, as I see it right now, is integrated water management, you know, various acronyms, right? The difficulty is, at least just looking here in Texas, that's not how we've done things traditionally, and it's, it's a big ask, right? I mean, trying to integrate our uh, groundwater availability models with our water availability models for surface water from TCEQ, I mean, that's, that alone, reliably, scientifically, that it's, it's tough and it will take time. But there, as I understand it, there are efforts underway on that point, so I just want to grab that part. Thank you. And then I'm just going to throw in um, a, a question, kind of a question that was submitted. Um, and Daryl, I think, I think it's to you specifically, which is that do you ever find in your projects that um, a, a landowner or a developer has a very particular idea of what it is that they're wanting to produce? And so you're trying to determine if the project is capable of producing that and, and kind of, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say the term that we're all thinking right now. <laughs> But, but I think that there's this question, right, about how, how it is that you go about that from a de developer standpoint. And, and do you find that that's ever the case, that you're having to deal with developers that are looking to develop a very particular amount and looking for the availability to, to be that? Uh, I was finishing up the report yesterday morning. <laughs> very, very specific demand. They needed a certain rate for a specific period of time. Mm -hmm. And the economics of it are, it doesn't matter what it costs. Can, can you physically construct a well field that can generate that amount of water? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and I will say that in, in the whole big picture of things, my modeled numbers, I used an analytical technique and, and the modeled numbers and, and spacing the well field, I could do it. My uncertainty, because I only had one set of data to represent the whole area, well, the next well that we drill and complete is going to change. That number is going to go up or it's going to go down on my estimate of availability. Guaranteed. Okay. Will happen. And, and so the, you know, dealing with that, the uncertainty of the heterogeneity of the system at the site really controls, you know, how I, you know, yeah, I give them the number and I say mathematically, yes, and, but, you know, it could change. Sure. Thank you. Well, I think that this is a great place to end uh, thinking about those, those local conditions and, and managing to that. Um, join me in, in thanking this panel so much.